This is LS, and you're on Thorin's YouTube channel, so cut the Western shit. The world's main event is upon us, and so, as is tradition in League of Legends, people, different casters, community members have put out those top 20 players at Worlds lists, where they rank 20 players in whatever order they want. Now, the distinction that I want to make is that oftentimes I've heard when this discussion comes up of like, should people make top 20 lists? How are they making the top 20 lists? Are the top 20 lists biased? Do they serve a purpose? Oftentimes, the distinction I see missed is that even when you go way, way back into the years where it was just LOL Esports doing these lists, they themselves even used to explicitly in the texts of the news posts say that it was like best of the best. They would say these are the 20 best players at Worlds. They didn't, and this is a distinction I want to make at the beginning, they did not say these are 20 players to watch at Worlds because that is an incredibly vague um, description. Obviously, there's so much mobility within that. I mean, you can just pick someone who didn't even do anything, but you're just saying, hey, watch that guy. You know, he's got a big name. He's got a cool storyline that I like. It was never that. That is instead a response, a reaction to the concept of these lists and often the backlash where you hear people say, well, maybe what they meant was 20 players to watch at Worlds. Like that's basically kind of like a compromise suggestion people made to make others seem less mad or to make it seem more plausible when there were some really wacky names in there, like some fucking LMS player being over some god tier player from Rocks Tigers back in the day. So to me, you, that approach, you could do it when he plays to watch it World's List. It would have its own, I think, value to some degree. I think just basically on a narrative angle, you could just be suggesting to people who only watch one region here are the players from all the regions generally to keep your eye out for. It's just not as interesting to me and holds a lot less weight than a 20 best players list. So the concept of this type of a list, I love the concept. I mean, anyone who knows me and my work knows I love hypotheticals. I just like op interesting opinions. I like people to be very, very specific about their subjective thoughts on something and go into as much detail as they can and give me kind of their process, the way they model the game, how they see things, how they perceive things, more so than just whether I agree with them this guy is number seven or number two. So I think also it serves a great purpose with in esports, it's good shoulder content, it's water cooler material that everyone on Reddit can discuss and give hot takes, everyone on Twitter can discuss and give hot takes. People can make their own response video, I disagree with this. They can make their own top 20 as a response to it. I think it's all great stuff. It's a, it's a way to get us all excited about the tournament, discussing the tournament, trying to think and also in the process of making these lists, who are the best? How are they the best? How do we model a game? How do we rank people from totally different regions who haven't played very much this year? So that's the reason why I want want not only these lists to exist, but I want them all to be individual lists. I want it to be VDS's top 20 list. I want it to be Jack's top 20 list. I want it to be LS's top 20 list. I don't just want the LOL Esports top 20 list because when it's done by committee, like people sit around, I'd argue double has got to be on this list, the other guy. I don't want him, but I do want this other player. So what if I put him 19 and we put the other guy? I hate that. I even more so absolutely despise any concept of doing it by aggregate. Like you have Jack submit his, and you have VD submit his, and then you have, I don't know, quick shot submit his, and then what you do is just aggregate the numbers, and then you go, right, well, this guy was 2, 7, and 13, so he's going to be on there, but he's going to be around like, like that's even worse. That's nobody's top 20 list because it's just a mishmash of everyone's I want it to be a specific individual's list by, so I want it to be one list by one person with one consistent set of criteria that they can then explain and discuss. That's the key thing, because to me, the most interesting thing you can do with these lists, the list is not the end of the discussion. The list is the beginning of the discussion. That's the problem with these lists, is that people want to just publish this list of names and then have that be the list. I know in the case of Vidius and Jack, like they had discussion over it and why they put people in certain places. That's what is the most interesting part, in my opinion, that comes from the exercise of making one of these lists, is I want to see people compare their lists and say, oh, well, I see you got this guy a lot higher than me. Like, why? I, I didn't think he was that good in this particular way. And I, I preferred other jungles over him. And that says, well, I actually watched the region a lot. And I saw within the meta game of how that developed, he actually was doing some very unique things. That's what I want to see. I want to see discussion. Now, within that, yeah, you can argue over things and you can challenge each other. But to me, it's more interesting to just allow people more of a longer form set of circumstances in which they can explain why they saw it that way. And in doing so, because to me, it's way more interesting why they want a certain player there and for what reasons than the name of the player and the number he's at. That only has a very simple, cheap novelty thrill. Even then, if I just say, right, oh, Chauvy, number two on LS's list. Well, without him telling me why and the way he modeled it, that really isn't of much value. It's just shocking. Like, whoa, Chauvy, number two. But then that's it. I don't get anything more from it, do I? So I'll also add in 
another reason I think it's way more interesting to have the discussion and have people actually have one list and have their own criteria is practically no one, at least of the people who are making these lists, watches all the major regions. So they're not going to be enough of an expert in every region to really make like the closest to like the definitive list. No, this is just Jat's list, with whatever he watched of FPX in China or watched some of the Korean games. But I doubt he watched LMS. I doubt he watched it super, super deep in the Chinese LPL over the year. Don't know if he watched all of EU even. He was out of the game for a long time. So it's not like there is anyone's going to come that close to like a really definitive list anyway. Now, in terms of making the list, so I have some comments to make because I think most people actually did a fairly poor job making their lists. And are you ready? I'll go ahead and drop my little controversial statement right now. I actually think of all the people who made their lists, so far, the best I've seen, within reason, it is still the person I'm talking about, is got to be LS's actually. I think his had some of the most consistent criteria. Because when you decide the criteria for a list, this is the point I want to make to content creators out there. I've done a lot of lists myself, top 10 players of all time, top 10 players who've yet to win a major. One of the things you've got to do is not just make the list and then decide as you're going. So how am I evaluating these? No, no, before you put a single name on that list or a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, an order, you need to decide your criteria. So you need to sit down and decide, right, here are all the criteria I'm considering. Now I'm going to weight them. So this is more important than the others, but then I'm going to balance into that. So that's more important, but this one still counts for 70% of that. Then you've got to ask yourself stuff like, if I come to a tiebreaker where on these two criteria, someone's perfectly matched, which other factor, which as I've weighted it, can supersede that or tip the balance? How will I decide in that scenario? You do that before you make the list. Then once you make your list, it's going to test you. There are going to be times where before you made the list, you might have thought, I think actually the shy might be number five. But then when you put your criteria and you start going down, you might get eight names using the criteria before you can put the shy in. Like actually he would have been beaten. He would have been broken on certain ties, certain criteria that you valued very highly. He lacks in another one. That's the other thing. It'll really test what you think. Like you won't know going in exactly the exact rankings of all 10, all 20 of the players in a particular case. But it'll make sure you stay on the straight and narrow as it were and make it coherent coherent and consistent if you do it that way because those are the two descriptions that you want for this list if you've done it successfully is it should be coherent a similar set of logic applied in a manner that's fair and it should be consistent you should consistently apply those reasons and that logic for one person you shouldn't say well Faker was one of the greatest players ever when he goes to world so forget his current form and then for another guy go sure this guy's never been a world but what a monster he was domestically so he's right up there it's like the, you've been unfair and inconsistent with how you've applied your criteria so in terms of making these lists I'll give you a a little, a little visual example of the problem I see here is a lot of people, when they make these lists, these are the broad sets of criteria, the themes that they choose for their list. They might choose the people who are the 20 best players right now going into Worlds. So they qualify for Worlds and these are the 20 best now. So that would mean names like Chovy, Showmaker might be way higher up this. Jackie Love might be higher than Uzi I because Jackie Love played in my opinion better as an AD carry than Uzi I did over most of the summer. You might have someone like um, Caps might be above Faker. That's not ridiculous that can happen. You can have a whole bunch of different names out there who you've valued higher. Or you could do 20 best players ever that qualified for Worlds. So obviously Faker would be number one, like Uzi I would be super high up. You might have the 20 best players specifically in how they play it when they get to Worlds slash international competitions. So right, yeah, Faker would still rank very highly, so would Uzi I. But then for example, someone like, um, I mean, an obvious one to me would be Maybe an example like maybe Broxer would rank higher because he did so well at last Worlds than a lot of people would have him on. Like a lot of people wouldn't even have him on their top 20 list at this point. I think that's a pretty good example. I want to point out though, what I actually think in terms of, as I alluded to before, as to why LS did a very good job with his list, is he took a totally unique set of criteria, a theme in general, that I thought was really interesting because it pr pr produced a completely different list. Which he just tried to look at who the 20 best players were in the most literal sense. Like These are just the 20 best players who happen to be at world. So in his opinion, since he thinks mid lane is the most important role at the moment, has the best mechanical players overall, most of his list were mid laners. Whereas, for example, I think Tarzan was the only jungler that made the list. Like He actually didn't see these other players despite the fact, you know, he might consider, yeah, Jankos might have been the MVP in Europe, but 
20 best players, we're not talking about certain amount of roles have to make it, certain amount of regions have to make it. If he really thinks all the Korean middlers are the best, then they get on the list and they get very high up. I thought that was a very interesting take because it's such a different approach, such a different exercise, a different process than everyone else used. Now, as I said, I don't know if he was entirely consistent. I'd have to really go through it with a fine tooth comb because I don't know if he himself set all his criteria as set, as defined as I would personally like it before he made the list. But one of the things about LS's list, I thought that really helped elucidate the problems we're making these lists is when you have to consider things like that his might sound ridiculous to you all like wow that's a bit too rigid like, typical ls he just thinks of like koreans and he thinks of mechanics only and he looks at what you did in solo queue and if you play off roles and he's judging it on that no the point is there's not very much data to judge a lot of these players on ben and i were doing it for worlds it's not for how they just performed domestically it's not only how they did historically so as a result you get into all these scenarios where yeah how do you judge like should i have all the mid laners like should nagori and the shy and all these people be above someone like Hillasang, who's an amazing support player. But when I actually look at him in terms of like, as a player, does he have to do as much as the shy? Can he do as much as the shy? Can he have as much mechanical impact? Can he have as much overall impact as the shy on the game? Because to some degree, Hillasang needs his lane partner to help him. He needs the team to set him up. He needs certain picks. Maybe the shy doesn't out often as much. So as a result, doesn't the shy have some natural role advantage? Doesn't it skew in his favor to some degree? Then you go to anything that isn't directly visible inside the server and it becomes really tricky. Like how does Doinby get on these lists when as far as we can tell, I don't think anyone would say he's the most godlike laning mid. Even in team fights, is he the absolute best mid in team fights? I don't know that anyone would say that. But the problem is people know the aura. They know that history suggests that he's one of the key pieces and a key shot caller and that he sacrifices things for others in the game. But how does that work out when you put money best players? There? Should he still be on there? What do you do with intangibles? What do you do with like this thing of being clutch? But they might mean being clutch in two tournaments they ever saw. Should that value you as a player if over the years someone played amazing in lane in their region and they never got a chance to be clutch? What about junglers? What about supports? What about players that inherently their role, with the exception of certain ultra phenomenal players, need others on the map to do certain things before they even get activated to be able to take over the game, to be able to have that big impact, as opposed to certain roles like mid and top that sometimes can just have massive success on their own individually without as much help from others, and in fact, in spite of others failing them at times. So I thought that was pretty interesting overall, because look, what I'll show you is, right, these are the types of lists that you would expect to see if people were, were actually putting a lot of emphasis on being consistent and coherent. So you'd see a list like this. It'd be someone's top five. So it'd be a Chauvy number one, mid laner of Griffin. You'd have Clid, jungler of SK Telecom. You'd have Doinby, the mid laner of FPX. You'd have Yankos, the jungler of G2. And you'd have the support player, Hillasang of Fnatic. Like these are players who, if someone was judging this and I said, guess the criteria. Right, if the criteria overall, you've guessed, like the most importantly weighted criterion and the general theme of the criteria was players who've performed the best overall in the world in the lead up to Worlds, this list would look great, right? You've got the arguably the best laning player of Griffin. You've got a player who was massively influential on SK Telecom. You have Doinby, who pretty much is FPX in terms of a lot of what he does as a captain. You have Jankos, the MVP, best player in Europe in terms of how that was evaluated. And then you have Hillasang, I think the most influential at the moment, best performing player of Fnatic. That's a perfectly reasonable list. The problem is, you don't see many lists like that, do you? Now, in contrast, I'll show you another list. Here's a different top five. Let's see if you can guess what the criteria for this one was. So the criteria for this one was best ever players at a world. So you have Faker there, of course. He's won the most worlds. He's had the most epic worlds performances. Uzi has been right up there behind him with epic performances every year, like destined to always get out of groups, it seems. Rookie, yeah, he's only been to one worlds. He won it and was arguably the fucking MVP of it. What a godlike player. Perks, what, one of the best clutch players we've had in the West. Big game performer overall at Worlds, even when he had some bad Worlds in the early days. A lot, a lot of Western players obviously have had big deep runs. The Shy, he obviously won Worlds. He was super influential on the meta. He smashed all the tops he faced. Like, this would be an interesting list if you wanted those all-time great ones. But here's the problem. You don't tend to see lists like either of the two I just showed you. What you see instead is a list like this. This is the kind of list I'm seeing from everyone. And this is why I'm getting a bit irritated with how people have applied their criteria and how they've decided the list. And I think there's something off with the process. So this list is all over the place. So it starts with Faker. I don't know anyone who even calls him the best Korean mid lane, and never mind Korean player or player right now in the world, yet he's number one on the list. Why? Because historically he's great, because it's Faker, because I'm sure Faker will perform at Worlds. He always does. Like weird elements of that, right? 
Then you've got Perks, one of the greatest Westerners, had an amazing Worlds last time. Played a different role entirely, of course, so all over the place again with how you're going to play as what? Is he going to be the second best player in the entire world at Worlds of all the players? Very unlikely. Pretty unlikely to even be the best player on his team. So then you go to number three. We're back in the fake one again. Okay, we've got someone who's still very good now, but is he the absolute best AD carry in China? Most people wouldn't even say that at the moment. Historically, yeah, he's great. But then again, are we just going off past? But then we've got Clid. Well, what fucking experience does Clid have going to Worlds? What has he ever done historically? Oh, but he's super hot right now and he's super sick for SK Telecom. Okay, kind of a bit weird that he's in there now. And then we've got Doinby again. What history does he have going to Worlds? Why is he on the list if that was the rest of it? Also, isn't it for shot calling? Is it for... Like, see what I mean? It's all over the place in terms of how they've done this. And I'm just not generally a fan of it. Like, one thing I'll say is, this is where Vidius and Jat seem to take a different approach. Like, I believe they said something like their list was they were predicting how these players would perform at Worlds. Now, that to me seems like a fool's errand. Like, the idea you can go, well, Faker's always amazing at Worlds. What the fuck does Faker in 2013 or 2015 have to do with Faker in 2019, six or four years later? Not a whole lot. I would argue less than a player coming out now who's never been to Worlds, but who's a monster right now at the moment. Like, obvious example would be someone like Clid. I'd say Clid's current form is more indicative of a predictor of how he'll play at Worlds than Faker in 2013. But in their angle, they've gone for that one. I actually think their approach, if that indeed was their criteria, is probably the least interesting of the ones I've suggested, actually. I don't think it's going to yield that much in terms of being interesting, because too much of it's just like predicting and using your own, as I said, I think switching up some of the criteria as you go, basically, and then not really being on the same page for every aspect. Now, I will say, all of the lists I saw this year from big-name people were way better than those shit shows back in 2014 and 2015, back when, as I said, they would leave off legendary players. There were always way too many Western players on those past lists, whereas actually now you could even justify putting more Westerners on. They would always put like LMS players on there just to try and be like diverse or some utterly sinister bullshit like that, even though those players would be way worse than the best player coming out of China or Korea or whatever who didn't make the list. They would simultaneously, some people would overpraise Koreans and just put them like, well, all Koreans must be best. Some people would, because they wanted to include other regions and double lift and Bjergs, and they would actually punish Koreans. So you could be insanely good. You could be the fifth best mid laner in the world, but your problem is you play in the LCK and your team qualifies as third, and you can't even make a top 20 list. But Bjergsen can just beat up on NA players, sneak game five of a finals, and he'll still be top 20, guaranteed. Even though you've never done far call, and that criteria, again, seems very suspect, right? So I love these lists generally. I think they do have value, but it's more for how you model the list, how you explain the list, and then after that, we can get all sorts of interesting elements out of them. This video was kindly supported by Alexander Rao, Alice the Alchemist, Blunt Smoking Anus Destroyer, Dane Cuskley, Dean Tanglis, Ho Chi Mao, J Dobbs, Nate Dio Double G, Ollie J, Patrick Ribeiro, Tobias Bernasconi, Who the Fuck is Viathan, and special thanks as always goes out to Jerky's Minion. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Maybe you want to ask me a question in my monthly video AMA. Do you want teasers for the guests for my upcoming content? Maybe you want to take part in a discussion with me about esports. Well, Put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.